Our first speaker is Georgie Harmon, CEO of Beyond Blue. I think you've been there since about 2014, is that right, Georgie? Um, her address will focus on shared priority, ensuring good mental health for our people. She has, my notes here say she has a broad range of policy experience and service delivery both here and in the UK. She had worked for the Dep Commonwealth Department of Health with responsibility for Australian mental health, suicide prevention and substance misuse and programs, responsible for early strategy and development of legislation. Um, to introduce plain packaging of tobacco products, of course that was a world first. Um, but I was interested this morning, uh, I'm not sure if you've been using your hashtag on the, the tweets, don't forget, hash CAA uh, 2017, uh, uh, Congress. Um, but Georgie tweeted this morning, uh, and her tweet, one of her tweets anyway, don't underestimate the power of a simple conversation. Make it one you have today if you're worried about somebody. Um, when she was appointed to Beyond Blue, one waggish uh, journal said that she, Georgie Harmon brings harmony to Beyond Blue. But she's always been concerned for others. She had been working in her uh, years ago in, in, in well-paid positions, but didn't feel that was enough. So she started volunteering and starting with several years with the Terence Higgins Trust. Um, and in, when, at that time when she was doing that, she had a revelation that she wanted to give something back. And now she does so uh, in Beyond Blue. And so ladies and gentlemen, would you please join me in welcoming Georgie Harmon. Thanks, Lynn. Um, so my former boss, Jeff Kennett, used to call me Miss Harmony. Um, my new boss, Julia Gillard, who actually sends her apologies, she would have actually been here today, um, so unfortunately you've got me, um, but she's actually overseas. Um, so yes, Miss Harmony, you can address me that at any time and I do answer to it. Um, I'd like to just begin by acknowledging that we meet today on the land of the Ghana people and pay my respects to their traditional elders past, present and future. I'd also like to acknowledge that I bring from Melbourne very strong winds and some germs, um, but apparently after last night's um, trophy grab by Ambulance Victoria, we're not allowed to talk about Victoria any further. And I say that as a proud Victorian. Um, I'd also like to open today by saying how much uh, Beyond Blue values our relationship with each ambulance organisation represented here today, and in particular with the CAA. And I'd just also like to, to do a shout out to David Waters and Ross Coburn for their leadership, but also uh, National Secretary Steve McGee, who I know can't, can't be here, um, uh, and, and all of the union uh, members represented today. You are doing fantastic work in championing workplace mental health and suicide prevention. And I uh, take my hat off to you. We work with a lot of industries and um, I'd love to say that everybody has the passion and genuine commitment of the ambulance sector, but unfortunately I've got a bit of a way to go to get there. Um, most people working in the ambulance services industry manage the extraordinary demands of your profession extremely well. They're protected to, to an extent by their commitment to the job, their desire to help others, their professional fulfilment and the culture of camaraderie that exists. And these all have powerful protective factors. But unfortunately, they are just not enough when it comes to safeguarding the mental health of all of our employees, volunteers and members. Mental health conditions have no respect for rank or uniform. They recognise no state boundaries, make no distinction between head office and regional outpost. They're as likely to affect those stationed in Norseman or Nambour as those working at Greenhill Road in Eastwood. We know from our work at Beyond Blue that health professionals are at increased risk of developing mental health conditions. We know this because we started the Doctors' Mental Health Program back in 20, 2009 to address the very, very high prevalence of depression, anxiety and suicide among Australian medical students and doctors. Our initial focus in this program was to build an evidence base to raise awareness and to begin to break down the stigma. Our commitment involved advocating for better mental health support and cultural change for doctors, 
and encouraging doctors themselves to take action for their mental health and to look out for their colleagues. In late 2013, we re released some very raw and confronting findings from a national survey of doctors and medical students. But unfortunately, history suggests that there may not have been sufficient action taken at a leadership level in that particular profession. I have no delight in taking you through what's occurred since the survey findings into doctors and medical students were released um, three or four years ago. In March 2015, four young doctors took their lives in one week in Victoria, leading to a response from hospital administrators not matched in other states. But now it seems history has repeated itself. In the past 12 months, there have been reported suicides of seven junior doctors and senior doctors in New South Wales. And it appears to be the brave and inspiring campaigning of the families of some of these doctors which has been the catalyst for change. So I implore you to not let history repeat itself. Later this month, Beyond Blue will launch Root and Branch Practical Reform Guide for health services on how to build and sustain mentally healthy workplaces across their sector. This was developed in collaboration with a multidisciplinary team of health and hospital professionals. We know that this kind of reform takes time but time seems to be a luxury that we can often ill afford. You all are familiar with these statistics. Ambulance paramedics have higher rates of suicide compared to professionals and operational staff, compared to other professions. And operational staff are particularly at risk of psychological distress, burnout, and suicidal ideation. And this is a, a recently published paper which shows that among emergency services personnel, males are 1.4 times more likely and females twice as likely to take their own lives as other professions. And I think as a, as a CEO of an organisation and having been responsible for a workforce where I've lost people to suicide, I know that this never leaves you. Um, these are your friends, these are your colleagues. Across the health and emergency services sectors, heavy workloads, long hours, shifts, work home balance stress, bullying, harassment, occupational violence, exposure to trauma, all play a part in the risk. So when it comes to ambulance services where you combine the pressures of health professions with the demands of emergency services, are the mental health outcomes really so surprising? In recognition of the growing evidence of people who work and volunteer for ambulance services, that, and they experience significantly high rates of de depression, anxiety, stress and PTSD, Beyond Blue established its own police and emergency services program in 2014. And we aimed to do three things, to reduce the stigma, increase the number of personnel taking action to manage their own mental health and support colleagues, and increase the number and capability of police and emergency services organisations themselves taking action to create mentally healthy workplaces. So the first step was an audit of existing mental health programs provided by agencies across your industry and the development of a good practice guide to guide you in creating mentally healthy workplaces. And this is available at that link on this slide. A pivotal, a pivotal component of our program has also been that deep engagement and collaboration, um, establishing opportunities for greater partnerships and collaboration nationally. So after launching this good practice framework, We've actually spoken to every single uh, police and emergency services agency in Australia, either directly or through their mental health and wellbeing working groups. I'm delighted that the framework appears to be taken up and used. It's assisting agencies to review policies and practices. It's informed the development of many agencies' mental health strategies. In the program though, currently, um, we're moving into the next stage and that is the undertaking of a major national research study into the well-being and mental health of police and emergency services personnel. This is a world first project. It's funded by Beyond Blue with major, a major contribution from the Bushfire and Natural Hazard Cooperative Research Centre. The study will draw for the first time a national picture of the prevalence of mental health conditions and suicidal thinking across Australian police and emergency services personnel. 
So the specific aims are, in addition to understanding the prevalence, the risk, uh, to also understand the risk factors that contribute to mental health conditions and the protective factors that may mitigate against their development. And also the actions that both employers and employees might take to prevent and improve outcomes. It will bring together stakeholders and agencies across Australia to generate baseline national data and brand new knowledge. From this, we hope to see your organisations use this information to refine and develop your strategies for better mental health outcomes, and importantly, to measure the actions and outcomes that you put in place against this data. We will support you in doing so. The focus is fire, police, rescue, ambulance and state emergency services, and importantly, the study includes current and former personnel, volunteers, and their families. The participation of each and every one of your agencies is unique and invaluable. You will have the opportunity to listen to the voices of your people, current and retired, and translate the findings into real actions to protect and empower them. This is a three-phase study, and the first was a qualitative survey, which we've actually concluded uh, the results were delivered to us um, in draft form in, uh, late last year and we're, we're going through and analysing the data. It gathered the personal mental health experiences of current and former personnel and importantly their families. Interviews were non-directive in nature, exploring the challenges of the workplace and the impacts of those challenges as well as potential changes for the better. Participants were able to share as much or as little of their own experience of mental health conditions as they felt comfortable discussing. So I'm about to give you a sneaky peek into just some of this qualitative data and some of the kind of high level analysis and findings and themes that we're starting to extrapolate. Um, we are still working through that analysis, so this is just one part of the study. But what the study showed was that there are three distinct profiles that are emerging. And that line down the bottom of this slide, the impacts of poor workplace practices and culture were seen as being just as, if not more, debilitating for these people who participated in this study. So again, three distinct profiles. Um, the, the first group uh, talked about causation. They ascribed their experiences of PTSD, in particular, to their employment as they saw it the root or underlying cause of their illness was exposure to traumatic events, although many also talked about the impacts of unhelpful workplace culture and poor self-care. The second group um, focused on experience and impacts. They described their experience of mental health conditions and they uniformly linked this to poor workplace practices and culture. Many had issues with management. So it's not surprising that they also reported experiencing barriers to help seeking. And the third group, excuse me, pro profiled um, with a real focus on external factors. They were typically volunteers and they tended to see their mental health as peripheral to their participation. In fact, they were more likely to consider that volunteering had positively impacted their lives through creating a sense of purpose and social connection. These three different story arcs highlight that it is not just operational exposure to trauma or critical incidents that contributes to mental health conditions of your people. The impacts of poor workplace practice and culture were just as debilitating and in some cases even more debilitating. This includes leadership as, and management as well as teamwork and culture, poor rostering, extended shifts, heavy workloads, and adversarial workers' compensation schemes. But while the research participants tended to see either trauma or workplace factors as being the primary cause of their mental health condition, their narratives made clear the interplay between negative personal, organisational, and operational experiences and subsequent increased vulnerability to psychological injury. A quarter of those involved in the survey were ambulance employees and volunteers, retired members or family. Some of those taking part had been diagnosed with PTSD. 
They all attributed their illnesses to repeated and cumulative exposure to highly stressful and traumatic events, but they also talked of a sudden and dramatic decline in their ability to cope. They often spoke of a tipping point, a single event or moment in time that seemed to change their lives. And it was only after their diagnosis by a mental health professional that they were able to see that tipping point and that see that, that that tipping point was actually a delayed response to exposure to cumulative stressful events. And here are some de-identified um, direct quotes from some of the survey participants. In the longer term, the yucky jobs in your memory bank build up. They most felt their susceptibility to PTSD and other mental health conditions were increased by long working hours, by inadequate sleep, by bad diet and poor self-care. The shift work is pretty horrendous. I mean, these are management leadership challenges that you all face, but these are being confirmed um, through these survey participants. They didn't necessarily see uh, their condition, their mental health condition, as, the, as uh, these conditions, the, the workplace conditions, as the cause of their illness, but they felt a reduced ability to bounce back from stressful or emotionally challenges, challenging events. And these work conditions and, and construction structures seemed to be a contributing factor. Extreme fatigue was also reported as a major risk for PTSD in both police and ambulance services personnel. And some linked their illness to long days and nights at work and not enough downtime between jobs. Those who've been diagnosed with PTSD typically described a progression of symptoms, beginning with irritability, angry outbursts, difficulty sleeping, nightmares, flashbacks, hypervigilance, paranoia, low confidence and self-doubt. For many, the impact seemed to be greater at home than at work. They found themselves becoming less patient and more argumentative with their family. They drank more and they spoke less. They began to lose interest in going out with people outside of work and they found themselves increasingly isolated. Most admitted to self-medicating with alcohol, tobacco, drugs, sex, or food as a way to de-stress. Some described a feeling of being detached from their lives and loved ones. They lost interest in people, places, and activities that in the past gave them solace and joy. Some recalled that family and friends had commented on changes in their personality and behavior. At the time, they couldn't see it though, and they denied that anything was wrong. A common trait was the initial determination to push through often using alcohol, drugs, food, or work as diversions. Only later could they see their lifestyle choices were covering up deep emotional wounds, and their coping me me methods were increasing their susceptibility to mental illness. Over time, the cracks deepened, symptoms worsened. Some progressed to experiencing extreme symptoms. For others, however, the effects were relatively short-lived. Being able to talk through their experiences early on instead of pushing their emotions aside, may have lessened the impact. Others suspected that they had PTSD, but they never told anyone. All sought treatment, they hid their symptoms, they put their masks on every day, and found excuses instead to avoid situations that might trigger their anxiety. For the most part, they assumed their colleagues didn't notice, that they weren't always coping well at work, or perhaps they found it easier to turn a blind eye. The ability to put uncomfortable emotions aside in a crisis is essential for everybody working in police and emergency services. However, it also seems that this can get in the way of people recognising the early signs of possible mental health conditions in themselves. They can become barriers to help seeking. Most of the people in our survey who reported PTSD um, had significant changes in their behaviour, personality and effectiveness at work over several months if not years, before they were diagnosed. It was only after they were diagnosed that they were able to see the changes in their behaviour as a warning sign of what was to come. Experienced police and emergency services personnel clearly pride themselves on their ability to take charge in a crisis, to withstand the kinds of pressures that would make ordinary people crumble. 
This was partly attributed to the training they receive, but there was also a view that it took a certain kind of person, mentally strong, focused, calm and rational, to be effective in your line of work. Having PTSD or another mental health condition for that matter was at odds with how they saw themselves and some carried a deep sense of shame and embarrassment which stopped them seeking early treatment. Some were reluctant to tell their partners for fear of upsetting them. They see their mission as life, in life as protecting and helping others and this included shielding the people they love from distressing elements of their work and the vulnerability of their mental state. There was also a reported sense that many police and emergency services managers do not have the training and skills to support staff who've been diagnosed and that some perceive mental health conditions still as a sign of weakness. This, this, it, this lack of support and in some cases concerns about being judged or ridiculed added to their worries. And even in workplaces where PTSD was acknowledged by employees and employers as a valid, as a valid sorry, occupational hazard, fear of being branded damaged goods was a significant reported barrier to people putting up their hands for help. People were also concerned that they would be seen as a weak link in terms of the team and they could no longer be relied upon to make good decisions in a crisis. Some were convinced they would be forced to resign if their manager found out what was going on. So again, that's just a very brief speed date with some of the themes that came out of the mouths of the men and women um, who worked for you or are working for you. So in terms of the next stage of the, f of the study, phase two, um, this will involve a nationally representative survey of police and emergency services in personnel, a personnel in Australia, examining a broad range of issues including prevalence, help-seeking behaviour, risk and protective factors. Phase two of the research study goes into the field from September onwards and that is going to be graduated depending on the needs of your organisation. And I want to stop and pause and congratulate every single organisation in this room. Um, every single ambulance organisation in Australia is participating in this study. That is just phenomenal that again demonstrates um, the importance that you're placing on this and your willingness to uncover new data, even though it might actually be not that pretty. And finally, uh, phase three will be a collaborative project where we'll bring together a range of perspectives from around the country on how the findings from stage, stages one and two can actually be translated into practical improvements. It will involve end users in the research and in the design and development of these, this translation piece. Beginning in early 18, we will agency by agency have meet, be seeking meetings and consultation support and provide free consultation support to your agencies. The outcomes will be available for all agencies to identify their priorities and how they can respond using their combined and individual expertise. And again, we will be there to assist you. At a national level, the project will identify common priorities and strategies for action, state by state, sector by sector. So I urge you as your leader, you've already signed up, ready yourselves and your colleagues to respond to the results. And as you do so, bear this in mind. A 2015 Beyond Blue report, the state of workplace mental health in Australia, sur surveyed more than 1,000 workers from all kinds of workplaces sectors and industries across Australia. It demonstrated the stark disconnect that we as leaders feel, think, believe and what our troops really want from us and how they see us. So for example, 71% of leaders who participated in this 2015 study believed that they were actively promoting good mental health at work but only 37% of their staff agreed. So what's the reason for this yawning gap? As leaders, we know everything, right? We assume that our teams pour over our communications from above and that they absorb the information and messages that we impart. They listen and they hear our key messages, right? 
they click immediately through to the policies and pr procedures and initiatives that we hyperlink for them and encourage them to use. I've never forgotten the advice of a communications expert um, who gave me some very frank advice when I was whinging about the fact that, you know, I'm so sick and tired of saying the same thing. I'm s why don't the staff listen? We're doing all of this stuff that they keep on telling me we're not doing. And she said, Georgie, it's only when you are so sick of hearing the same thing come from your mouth that people actually start to listen. So we have to walk the talk. We have to be persistent. We have to be authentic. And we have to be prepared to share our own stories, to not be defensive, to, to admit that we don't have all the answers and to seek genuinely input from every single corner of our organisation. Just going back to that 2015 study, overwhelmingly the employees that, we, that participated in that study said that they did not have a work-life balance. And so resources and training that focus on building the resilience of paramedics and other staff working in your organisations are just not enough. They address only one part of a very complex issue. One of the big concerns identified in our research is employees working overtime and the ex expectation that they do so and do so often. Let's not forget we already know from research from your sector suggests that organisational factors such as manager support, poor management systems, rather than operational factors and exposure to frontline trauma as a paramedic are far more critical in shaping your staff's experience and mental health in the workplace. The impact of poor mental health in terms of productivity is real and it's happening right now. Depression is the leading cause of disability worldwide. The World Health Organization predicts that by 2030 it will be the leading cause of dis disease burden globally. Disease burden being the combination of disability and premature death. So let's take a closer look at what this means for your organisation. Is your organisation truly mentally healthy? As leaders of your profession and in your workplaces, it's my view that you must ensure you have an overarching mental health and wellbeing strategy and that this has appropriate priority to implement it, sustain it through resources dedicated to it. Staff working in emergency services have identified they experience a broad range of risk factors. Mentally healthy workplaces have a zero tolerance approach to bullying. They ensure there's both formal and informal confidential complaint handling processes for employees to report bad behaviour. And they deal with any reports of bullying or harassment consistently, quickly and fairly. We know there are a number of barriers to ambulance staff seeking support, including embarrassment, concerns about confidentiality and privacy, the concerns about the impact on their colleagues and their ability to practice. Many think that being angry all the time, not sleeping, worrying, feeling sad or isolated, not joining in social activities is just the way they are. They will not discuss how they're feeling at home or at work or go and see a doctor if they think they're going to be judged by others to be weak, not capable, have a flaw in their character, or be thought of as a burden to those around them. Another risk identified in our research was that work at stress at work can be caused by people not having clearly defined roles, or even just what's expected of them. Less than half of the managers and only one third of employees that we surveyed in that 2015 survey felt that they had clear job descriptions. There are those who don't tell the truth for absences or difficulties at work. And let's not forget the large numbers who self-medicate with alcohol or drugs to numb or obliterate how they're feeling. A mentally healthy workplace supports employees with a mental health condition to stay at or to return to work as soon as possible they develop and implement consistently simple stay at work or return to work plans with reasonable adjustments tailored for individual needs. We do this for physical injuries. You can do this for mental or, or psychological injuries. A mentally healthy workplace 
assist staff with a mental health condition, condition to seek treatment and support early. It's a place where all employees have access to services, support lines, information if they're in, unwell, and they have mechanisms to talk about their situation with someone they trust. A critical part of this workplace is, the, is, the, is, the, is building the skills and confidence of your managers and leaders to approach employees they may be concerned about. And this slide just shows some of the free resources that are available through our Heads Up website. I just want to pause for a minute and talk for a second. I know we're not supposed to talk about Tony Walker and Ambulance Victoria, but um, we've actually been working with AV for the last um, 18 months or so, and we're uh, about to, to complete um, the implementation of uh, a new training program for AV, all, all AV staff, be they frontline staff or back office staff, called Mental Health Matters at AV. Um, I was having a chat with Tony about, about it um, uh, recently, and we're coming to the end of it. We're about to evaluate it. But the headlines um, are that AV has seen a significant I uplift in the number of personnel who are actually accessing the supports and programs that, that AV has on offer. That has got to be a good thing. Um, Tony also said, and he was happy for me to share this with you, that his workers' compensation claims have increased. Now, you may think that that's a bad thing. I actually think that's a really positive thing. Um, we know that workers' compensation claim data should not be looked at on an annualised basis. It's, it's trends over time. And what this is showing is that people are coming forward probably earlier than they have done in the past as a result of, hopefully, this training. Um, to actually make claims to get themselves back on track to, to negotiate an outcome with their workplace. Um, one of the real challenges as well that we've seen in rolling out this program at AV is the willingness and engagement of corporate staff. Paramedics, they're there. They want to they participate. But the corporate staff, we had to sometimes drag them crick kicking and screaming to the training programs. So as I said, we, we're about to complete the, the first rollout. Um, we will be evaluating that program and we will make that information available to you um, at the earliest opportunity with Tony's permission. Um, the other thing that I just want to remind you about is that understanding of our individual mental health it exists on a continuum. Every single day or at certain points throughout our lifespan, we actually move from the green to the orange um, and, and hopefully never into the red, but, you know, it's a sliding scale. Um, and how does this translate into signs and symptoms? The traffic light system actually maps feeling changes, changes in thinking, changes in behaviour, and also physical health. Um, so you can actually use this kind of information to make aware to your staff and the managers what to look out for. Suicide risk factors. This was an uh, Instagram post that we put out about 18 months ago. We've had, I think, 3.2 million views of this since we put it out there, with no promotion, just stuck it up on our Instagram. Um, people want to know this stuff. There is a reticence still to talk about suicide, but we have to know what the signs and symptoms are, and there are some very clear ones here. So share this information these resources through the intranet, emails, common areas and team meetings. Play an active role yourselves in reducing stigma. If mental health struggles and illnesses are spoken about freely and confidently by you and your peers, staff are far more likely to feel that they can approach a manager or a colleague. Where possible, increase the input from employees on how they do their work. Think creatively. We all feel a great responsibility for our peers, our staff and our volunteers. We all want for them the greatest opportunity to enjoy their role, to stay well and to thrive in what they do. Valuing and improving mental health in the workplace is an untapped opportunity for all of us. It costs little in outlay, but it will require the strength of your leadership, the creative thinking of yourselves and your colleagues, your willpower and ongoing drive and teamwork to succeed and to last. So I ask you, are you willing to be one of those leaders 
who chooses to believe that they are doing the right thing, that they've ticked the box, or are you going to truly challenge yourselves? Are you going to speak openly about mental health and mental ill health? Are you going to speak openly to your staff? Are you going to model the behaviours you want to see in your organisation? Your organisation is already committed to our national research study. Communicate that. Encourage your staff and volunteers to participate. And most importantly, act on the findings. And again, we will be there to assist you. Imagine where we can be if in three years' time, ambulance services, regulators, unions, government and other key in health industry stakeholders work together to reduce the burden of mental health conditions and the rate of suicide. It will take time, it will take commitment, it requires real leadership, but the goal is achievable. Suicide is preventable. And let me leave you by um, my favourite quote that defines what a mentally healthy workplace looks like. It's a quote from Guarding Minds at Work, which is a Canadian organisation doing this stuff very well. A mentally healthy workplace is a place where people can work smart, contribute their best effort, be recognised for their work, and go home at the end of the day with energy left over. That is the best description of a mentally healthy workplace I've ever come across. And you can notice it doesn't mention illness, it doesn't mention medication, it doesn't mention doctors in white coats. This is what we all want for ourselves, for our peers, for our teams, for our volunteers. Thank you for the work you do and thank you for your partnership with Beyond Blue.